Okay, so this section is called angles and their measure, and there's just a few things we need to point out first and define. So we have an angle is formed by two rays meeting at a common vertex. We learned what a ray is back in geometry. So we have a close point on one end and an arrow where it goes on infinitely in the other end. So these are two rays meeting at a common vertex in the picture on the top right. The first ray is called the initial side, and the second ray is called the terminal side. So in this picture, based on how we're going to draw it in the future, this side right here is going to be the initial side, and the other side over here is what we call the terminal side, but we'll get more into that a little bit later. We typically use Greek letters to denote angle measure. All right, so you might know some Greek letters, so I'm just going to give you three examples. So for example, to denote angle measure, typically I default to theta myself. Theta is spelled T-H-E-T-A. People tend to pronounce that incorrectly a lot. The other ones I like to use are alpha, looks like a little fish right there, and beta right over here. All right. And next we have that we can have a counterclockwise rotation for our angles. When your angles rotate counterclockwise, it actually is going to give us a positive angle measure. All right. I know it seems a little weird because most people want clockwise to be positive because it goes with what you know, but it's actually not that way. And then the other one we have obviously now is the clockwise uh, rotation, and that will give you a negative angle measure. All right. So what we're going to get into is we're going to talk about how to draw our angles, how we typically draw our angles, how to show which way they went, and so on. All right. So next, we typically draw angles with the vertex at the origin, the origin being the point zero zero on the xy plane, and the initial side on the positive x-axis. So here what I have drawn are the x and y axes and the first thing we have, uh, need to do here is to review the quadrants. So in case you forgot which quadrant is which, quadrant one is the top right quadrant where they are all uh, positive x's and positive y's. Quadrant two from here we actually go, surprisingly or not surprisingly, um, makes sense, we go counterclockwise to quadrant two which is also part of the reason counterclockwise we go through the quadrants and that's a positive angle measure. Then in the lower left quadrant we have quadrant 3. Also we always represent our quadrants with Roman numerals. And lastly over here we have quadrant 4 which is IV in Roman numerals. Okay, now to draw our angles in standard position we always begin with what we described. We start with the angle's initial side and the initial side stems from the origin and it sits along the positive x-axis. Now the first angle we want to draw in purple over here is theta and theta is going to be approximately equal to 50 degrees. I'm using approximately because obviously I don't have a protractor so it can't be exact. So since 45 is in the middle, 50 degrees is going to be somewhere over here. Now that's not enough, okay? So it doesn't show us how we went from our initial side to our terminal side. So to draw the angle in standard position, we actually are going to take it one little step further. What we're going to do is we're going to draw a little arrow to show that we started on our initial side and we went around that way to get to our angle of 50 degrees. So that is 50 degrees angle theta drawn in standard position, all right? The next one we're going to do is going to be in red. It's going to be angle alpha, and it's going to be negative 310 degrees. So we just said before, negative angles have a clockwise rotation. So I'm going to start again with the initial side sitting along the positive x-axis. Now each quadrant is 90 degrees, so if I go around to the bottom y of the y-axis, that's negative 90. So I'm going to start there, negative 90 negative 180, negative 270. Now I'm going to come in to this quadrant, negative 310 degrees. It's going to be a certain amount around past 270. Since 270 was at the top, it's going to be 40 degrees further. It's actually going to meet up at this exact same location because the measure in here was 40 and the measure in there was 50, which made our right angle of 90 degrees. So they are actually going to overlap, and that would make our alpha negative 310 degree angle right there. 
When two angles meet at the same place, we actually use a word to describe them, and that word is coterminal angles. So they terminate at the same place. Last, we're going to do angle beta, and beta is going to be more than one full revolution. Beta is 410 degrees. So for the third time, we start at the positive x-axis initial side. I'm going to go around, that's 90, 180, 270, 360. To get to 410, I need 50 more degrees. So again, we get a third angle that meets at the exact same location as the others, 410 degrees, but I needed that arrow looped around to show which way I turned, so I went around counterclockwise, and how many times it went around. So that's how I know that beta was more than one full revolution, and it was 410 degrees. So they all terminated in quadrant one. Next we have to talk about quadrantal angles. So quadrantal angles don't ever terminate in a quadrant. They actually terminate between two quadrants. Um, between two quadrants would give it the name quadrantal. And some examples of that are, for example, we have something like 90 degrees, or obviously, keep going around, we have 180 degrees, and so on, 360, 540, whatever, even uh, 900 degrees, right there. All right, so those are some examples of quadrantal angles. If you had to describe where they terminated, you may say, oh, this one terminates on the negative x-axis or between quadrants two and three. Next, after that, we have some practice drawing an angle. So these are, uh, you're gonna have a bunch of opportunities just to pause the video, take the notes, um, you should be putting all of this in your notebook, writing it down, watching it is not enough for you to uh, memorize things long term. So we have 45 degrees, negative 90 degrees, 225 degrees, and 405 degrees. So hopefully you paused and already drew that all in your notebook. Maybe you already did the examples. So now is an opportunity for you to check your answers and make sure you did everything correctly. So I'm going to draw my initial side right here. 45 degrees puts me directly in the middle of quadrant one, and I draw a little arrow just to show how I got there. Negative 90 degrees, same concept, initial side, positive x-axis as always. Negative 90 actually puts me right there, arrow to show how I got there. The arrow does not point at the initial side, it only points at the terminal side. Next I have 225 degrees, that's going to put me right in the middle of quadrant three. I'm going to show how I went around by going that way. And our last angle, 405. Since it's greater than 360, we know it's more than one full revolution. So if I wanted to draw the loop first, so there is 360. To get to 405, I actually needed to add 45 more degrees. In my head, I just basically did some basic subtraction. 405 minus 360 left me with 45 degrees. So I knew that that's how much more. I need to go up and around. Sometimes some books will show how big this little extra piece of angle is right here. And they might label that and put a little 45 degree mark there. So you know that it's that much more than a full revolution. All right. Next we have converting. What we're going to do now is convert degrees to and from DMS. DMS actually stands for degrees, minutes, seconds. So before we get to that, I'm just going to talk about some basics, some that we know pretty well. So for example, my height, if someone asked me how tall I was, uh, my answer would be 5'6". And by 5'6", most of us know that we mean 5 feet and 6 inches. But I don't need to leave my answer as 5 feet 6 inches. More often than not, you found yourself in situations, maybe in Algebra 2, doing word problems, and you had to convert everything into one type of unit. So this one's pretty easy. Since it's 5 feet and 6 inches, that's also known as 5.5 feet. However, people tend to get confused and they think that 5.5 five uh, 5 .5 feet is actually 5 feet 5 inches and they make mistakes in their problems. But it's 0 0.5 of a foot and 0 0.5 of a foot is half of a foot and a foot is 12 inches so that is equal to six inches and a lot of these things are second nature to you because you do them in your head all the time so you don't really think of the math behind it and what you're doing to get to the answer another example is say the length of class is 45 minutes we would usually describe that length of time in minutes 
but maybe for a word problem, you need to describe it in hours. So what fraction of an hour or what percent of an hour is it? It's uh, three-fourths of an hour. It is 75% of an hour. So this is 0.75 hours. Again, the conversion might not be something you think about in your head too much. So let's say you finished a race and you finished that race in one hour, six minutes, and 12 seconds. And I wanted to convert that to only hours. So how did we convert things back in chemistry? Well, if you've already taken chemistry, you converted things using something called dimensional analysis. And I tend to do a lot of these conversions the way I learned when I was in chemistry. So I'm going to start off by converting my 12 seconds into minutes. It's going to make a decimal value for minutes. I'll tack it on to the six minutes. Then I'm going to take my minutes and convert those to hours. It's going to be a decimal of an hour, and I'll just tack that onto the hours, and my final answer will be in hours. So I'm going to show that work now. So I start off with 12 minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm just kidding, not minutes, 12 seconds, sorry. So I start off with 12 seconds. Now the way I do dimensional analysis, the way I do my conversions, is I make a little table. It might not make sense to you to do a little table, but what I've noticed is a lot of students forget, oh, is this where you multiply by 60 or is this where you divide by 60? And a lot of people will just kind of grab their calculator, try both and decide which one makes more sense and sort of go with that after. You're better off actually just knowing how to do it. And you're going to find yourself in situations where you need to convert things uh, and it's several steps. So we want to be able to do that really well and uh, efficiently. So I make this little chart and anything that is in the numerator and denominator stacked above each other has to be equivalent to each other. All right. Now I want seconds to cancel out and I'm thinking of the top bar right here going across this top row as a numerator and the bottom row as a denominator. So things will be able to cancel out just like when you multiply basic fractions. So I'm going to convert from seconds to minutes over here and anything I stack like I said before has to be equal. So how many seconds equal how many minutes? Well, we know really well that, hopefully, that 60 seconds is equal to just one minute. Now, I have a seconds on top. I have a seconds on bottom. So what does that mean for me? That means I can actually cancel out seconds the way you would reduce anything. So my final answer will be in minutes right now. And then 12 over 60 if I were to reduce that over here, I would get one-fifth of a minute if I wanted to think of it as a fraction, or I would change it to a decimal, and that would actually be 0 0.2 minutes. So what I want to do with this minute value is I want to tack it on to the minutes I had to begin with. So now I have one hour, six minutes, and 0.2 minutes. I can combine like terms, and now I'll have 6.2 minutes, and I need to convert that into hours. So I have 6.2 minutes and I'm gonna make another chart. I'm gonna have minutes on bottom and hours on top. So I know that I have 60 minutes and that is all what we have in one hour. So similar to before, my minutes value is going to cancel from top and bottom and then, oh yeah, 6.2. Uh, in this case, I need to grab my calculator because I don't know what 6.2 divided by 60 is in my head. So if you grab your calculator, you do 6.2 divided by 60, since it's a fraction, numerator and denominator means division, we end up getting 0. Point, now, this is unfortunate that we have to round, but so be it. 1, 0, 3, 3, 3, 3, repeating. So the 3's keep on repeating on and on. Now... With that, I can tack that onto the existing one hour part of my solution. So I'm going to have a final answer, and my final answer for that time in just hours is going to be, sorry, my answer is one point, because I'm adding the other answer, 1.10, one three repeating hours. Now the conversion is going to work the same when we're dealing with degrees, minutes, seconds. So we need to know the conversion factors. So we go over here and we need to know what one degree is equal to. Now degrees, minutes, seconds actually work exactly like degrees, minutes, hours. 
So in every degree, in every one degree, I use words and I use symbols. In every one degree, we have 60 minutes. So for minutes, I'm going to use the symbol uh, and the word. So obviously the word, we all know. Now the symbol for minutes is actually weirdly the same as the symbol for feet. So we all put 60 and one tick mark right there. And then next we have that one minute is equal to, and again, one minute is equal to 60 seconds. So we could write that with the word or we can write that with the symbol. And the symbol for seconds is equal to 60, and we have two tick marks right there. So if I could just go back for a second to the last slide. So I had degrees up here, and that's the degree symbol. And then DMS, I'll have degrees, I'll have minutes, and I'll have seconds with two tick marks. All right, so now that I have the conversion factors, I can actually do a problem here. So we have 50 degrees six minutes and 21 seconds and we want to convert that to degrees so maybe you want to try it by yourself and pause and then check if you did it right in a second and if you did do it or if you didn't do it and you're just going to watch um i'll show you that now so we have 21 uh seconds up right here so double tick mark and we're going to convert that now i can use the symbols exactly the way i would use numbers or the way i would use variables or the way I would use constants or uh, words, and I could still cancel things from top to bottom. So I'm doing my little chart, 21 seconds. Well, I know that there are 60 seconds in one minute. Do the math with my calculator. Maybe you can do certain parts in your head, but I end up getting 0.35 minutes. Now I'm gonna tack that onto the minutes I already knew I had, so I had six. So now it's gonna be 6.35 minutes. And we're just gonna convert that into degrees. So over here I'll have 60 minutes. On top I have one degree. Do that math in my calculator. And I get, uh, oh there it is, point, uh, .10. 5, 8, 3 repeating, so point one zero five eight three, and again the uh, the 3 only is repeating, so we have to round, but so be it, and that means that our final answer will be 50.1058, 3 repeating, uh, degrees. Next example, now we're going to go the other way and we're going to convert 21.256 degrees to degrees, minutes, seconds. So now it's going to be a little bit different if you want to give it a shot, pause, and try it by yourself using the same conversion factors and the same strategies, you can do that now. If not, we're going to take 0. 0.25 6 degrees. All right, we're going to leave the whole amount of degrees, the 21 degrees alone, because that's the D in the DMS, and we're going to just take the decimal, the fraction, and we're going to convert that first to um, minutes. So I'll make my little chart. Now I need the degrees to cancel out, so I know that one degree is equal to 60 minutes. Take out my calculator and put that in, and I get 15.36 minutes right there. So now I know that the M is going to equal 15 from that math right there. So that's the entire amount of minutes I have. Now the fraction I have of minutes is 0.36. So I'll just do another conversion, 0.36 um, minutes right here. And I know that one minute has 60 seconds. Take out the calculator again, do that math in the calculator, and we get 21.36 six seconds and unfortunately there's nothing to do um, to make it smaller right now so we're going to take that 0. 0.6 seconds and we're just going to use it to round and we'll end up with then 22 seconds so that is our s and now we could just write out our final answer and that one would be 21 degrees 15 minutes and 
22 seconds. And we're done. Now what we're going to look at uh, is some new type of measure that maybe you're not that familiar with. It's called a radian. So one radian is the measure of a central angle such that... All right, so now we need to know what the rest of that sentence is. So hopefully you're pausing along the way and taking notes. Such that... Oh, actually, that's not what we're going to put there. Uh, in the parentheses, what I wanted to say is that there are symbols for the word such that, or the phrase, rather. And sometimes you see it in set notation as a straight line up and down, kind of like one absolute value bar. Other times, um, certain mathematicians use a colon right here to represent the phrase such that when they don't feel like writing it out. And the one I saw most commonly in college for the phrase, uh, phrase such that, it would look like this backwards sideways horseshoe with a line in it. All right, so these all mean such that, and we can use them in our notation, and we will actually use, I tend to use the first one and the last one sometimes, and we're going to use those when we end up writing out the domain of trigonometric functions such as secant, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent because we're going to exclude certain values, and the phrase such that comes in very helpful. All right, um, this is by a, I think it was an Italian mathematician, and his name was uh, Giuseppe Piano, and he was the one that came up with a lot of this notation. Um, so such that the radius of a circle has the same length as the arc. So I kind of color coordinated a little bit with the blue for the radius, purple for the arc. So we're going to look at that now. So our, our blue radius, I can kind of draw on this circle right over here. And my purple arc needs to be the same length. So if I just were to eyeball it, I would say maybe about that big. So then the angle, if I go back to blue for my radius, right about there, the angle inside this um, sector theta would be one radian if I measured it out and I knew it were perfect. However, we don't normally look at our radians as whole numbers or decimals. We usually look at our radians as increments of pi or fractions of pi. So that's one thing that I wanted to mention in the three more things. So the first thing is that we usually don't look at one radian. All right. Instead, we focus on radians as fractions of pi radians. And then the third thing I wanted to mention is that radians are the only thing in math that don't require written units. So when you don't have units on the end of something, you're really just calling it a radian measure. So when you see 2 pi on your paper, it probably means 2 pi radians. When you saw 2 pi in circumference and when you saw pi in area, uh, that actually has a lot to do with radian values and you've been using them in area and circumference of a circle since before you had this lesson. All right, next we're going to find the length of an arc of a circle. So the book shows you to do s equals r theta. I just want to talk about that for a second. While it's great that the book has simplified this formula for you, I find this formula obnoxious because one, I find it annoying that s is arc length. There's no S in the word arc. There's no S in the word length. Why does S have to stand for arc length? Next, I have R is the radius, and I have that theta is an angle. We talked about that before. But there is another thing that's annoying, is that theta has to be in radians. So if you have your angle given to you in degrees, you would have to convert it to radians first before you can do this question, or you're going to get the wrong answer. So it looks cute and innocent, but in reality, it's sort of uh, difficult to work with. So we need to realize that arc length is a portion of the what? It's a portion of the circumference. Now, I brought up circumference before, and we know what those formulas are. And we sh our formula is, and we should be able to recall it without any trouble. So what is the formula for circumference? Hopefully you know, and I can say that is C equals 2 pi r. Now some of you learned pi d. I tend to never use that because I don't like the idea of introducing another variable into my word problems. I would rather just deal with one variable, that being r, and deal with that alone. 
people accidentally make mistakes all the time. They read the word radius or diameter and jumble them up. People read circumference and area, jumble them up, area and perimeter. So uh, why give ourselves another reason to jumble things up? Another thing that we need to know is how big is one full rotation around the circle? One entire thing. So one full rotation, we could either think of that as 360 degrees, which hopefully you knew without even thinking of, uh, thinking too hard, or there's another way to measure, and that's radians, which we just mentioned, but I'm going to let you know that a full revolution of the circle is 2 pi radians, and that's why that 2 pi is actually in the circumference formula. So arc length is, now, what is arc length? Arc length is a fraction of what? It's actually a fraction of the circumference. All right, so we need to get much better in this class at taking words and translating them into math formulas. So arc length, if you wanted to use the word arc length or if you really want to use the S that the book uses, you can do what you want. I'm going to use the word. So I'm going to say that arc length, now the word is translates in uh, math to a symbol and that symbol is actually the equal sign. A fraction, well that literally means we're going to have to figure out a fraction, so that bar right there represents the uh, fraction bar. The word of in math actually means multiply, and circumference is 2 pi r. Now the fraction, what fraction of the circumference? Well we just said a full revolution is either 360 degrees or 2 pi radians depending on how you're looking at it. All right. If someone says that you run for 50 minutes a day, you can figure out what fraction of your day that is by doing 50 over the number of minutes in a full day. So this is no different. So on top, I'm going to put the Greek letter theta to represent the angle that we're looking at. And on bottom, we really do have options. We could either have 360 degrees, or I'm actually even going to write the word or, because this is for us, um, we can put two pi radians. It depends on the problem. It depends which units they give us to start with. And so we don't have to do any converting. And if they give us radians, you'll see that the radian value will, uh, 2 pi will cancel with the other 2 pi and will simplify nicely. Next, we have an example. So if we want to write that down and try it on our own, and then I'll show you how to do it. Find the length of the arc of a circle of radius 8 meters subtended by a central angle of 0.25 radians. So what we have over here is a circle. I already drew the initial side. All right. And we are going to draw in the other side. Now we said that one radian is when the radius is equal to the arc length. And if the angle is 0.25 radians, it's going to be about a quarter of that length in a ratio perspective. So I would draw the other side, maybe right about there. All right, and then this is my angle theta in at the center of the circle. So I'm going to do this exactly the way we just described. And it's going to be a fraction of the circumference. Now 0.25 radians is my angle measure. And I don't really like using decimals, so I'm actually just going to convert that into a fraction. So 1 fourth. Now, I said before we don't need units. I'm going to put rad for radians for now until we get used to that. So it's 1 fourth over a full revolution, which is 2 pi. And that's also radians. So right away, those cancel out. Of, multiply, the entire circumference. Formula is 2 pi. And r is the radius. And we said that the radius was equal to 8 meters. So I'll have 8 meters, and I'm going to leave my units in the problem for now too, till we all get better at that. Now the 2 pi on top, that's on top, even though it's not written over anything, it's really over 1, uh, and the 2 pi on bottom right there actually cancel each other out. I'm left with 1 fourth times 8 meters, 
which gives me a final answer of arc length equals 2 pi meters. The meters didn't go anywhere, it didn't cancel out, it didn't square. There's your final answer. All right. Now, some conclusions that we can make from the last formula we worked with is that 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians since they're both one full revolution, and I wrote that down as well. This is actually really, really helpful, and it's going to be really important for things that we do later. And if we wanted to simplify it for ourselves, 180 degrees is actually equal to pi radians, which will be half a revolution, and these are very, very helpful conversion factors. So hopefully you wrote that down. Now we're going to convert from degrees to radians, so we could start by using those conversion factors. Those conversion factors don't stop being helpful here or here. We use them for a lot of other things, so we have to spend a lot of time on them. So we're converting 60 degrees from degrees to radians. So I'm going to do that exactly the way I did things before. I'm going to make myself a cute little conversion table. Now, how many degrees equal how many radians? I'm going to go to the reduced form. You pick and choose what you want to use. You don't have to, but that's what I want to do. So 180 degrees equals pi radians right now. I'm dropping the units, save a little space, 60 times pi over 180. You do not need to take out your calculator. All you need to do is simplify it, and we tend to leave the answer like that and call it a day. So what can we cancel? Well, the degrees cancel out, the zeros cancel out, and the 6 and 18 reduce. So my final answer is pi over 3, and that is pi over 3 radians. And I mentioned before, we tend to look at radians as fractions of pi. Here, I'm going to do the same idea. So I have 150 degrees, and I'm going to convert that. Hopefully you tried that. Work it out. I'm not going to show you the work. But 150 degrees works out to be a fraction of pi again. So we'll end up with 5 pi over 6. 45, well, negative 45. The negative doesn't go anywhere. You can set up a little conversion factor again. Do the exact same thing. Your degrees should cancel out. And your final answer should be negative pi over 4. Over here, 90 degrees, same concept. I hope you were able to do it. Maybe you were able to do that one in your head using the fact that pi radians is equal to 180 degrees, and then you could figure out that it would be pi over 2 radians. Last one, I'll show a little bit more work because this one doesn't reduce nicely. If it doesn't reduce to a nice fraction, I don't want to leave 107 pi over 180. That's sort of annoying. So something like this measurement, I'd probably change to a decimal. So down here, like the first example, I get 180 degrees, so the degrees cancel. I have pi radians up there. That reduces. In this case, I'm going to grab my calculator. I'm going to punch that in the calculator and get an answer. And that answer will be, let me just take a second here, 107 times pi which I got 336.15 divided by 180, and I got 1.87 approximately. So I'm going to change that. Now, more often than not, you're not going to be allowed to use a calculator, so you would leave your answer. But I don't know which way the book would expect you to do this. I know I, I do prefer fractions because they're exact. Decimals are rounded, and that's unfortunate. So whatever answer is fine. You could leave 107 pi over 180, or you could have found... 1.87, um, oops, I shouldn't have written degrees, radians. All right, next. Now we're going to be converting from radians to degrees, and this works the exact same way. Now you do have options. I'm going to kind of show you some weird ways to do this, but I have pi over 6 radians right now. I could choose to leave my radians in the numerator together. Then I could put pi radians down here, and I could put 180 degrees up there. Now if you see... My pi symbols will actually cancel out, but some of you tend to do weird things with uh, memorizing same change flip or flip and multiply. But if you really know your properties of math, these pi symbols do cancel out. So 3.14 cancels from top and bottom. I have 180 over 6 left, which gives me 30 degrees. So you can do it that way. If you're awkward with reducing your fractions, though, and the flipping and all that, Another option you have, and we can get it more into it in class, is you could actually draw your fraction bar out from here. 
By drawing it out from here, you avoid having a fraction within a fraction, and you could still get the exact same answer. I'm going to have pi down here, I'm going to have 180 degrees up there, and I'm still just going to carry on and reduce things as necessary. So from there, the pi symbols are gone. 180 and 2 reduces to 90, and then 90 times 3 is equal to 200 and 70. So my final answer is 270 degrees. All right, if you keep going and doing those, I'm just going to give the answer. You could choose to do them whatever way you want. Negative 3 pi over 4 is actually going to be equal to negative 135 degrees. You should try to do that without a calculator. 7 pi over 3 is going to be more than a full revolution. And some of you may be able to catch that because 6 pi over 3 is 2 pi, right? And if that's 2 pi, it's pi over 3 more than 2 pi. Pi over 3 is 60 degrees, so if you work it all out, you're going to end up getting 420 degrees. Right there. Now the last one is a little weird looking and people get upset with these, but that is 3. There's no units. The directions say we're converting from radians to degrees, so that's actually three radians, three times the size of one radian. All right, it's a little less than pi radians, so I know it's a little less than 180 degrees. So if you wanted to kind of know in your head how it should work out, if this one bothers you because it doesn't have pi and you're associating pi with radians, you could put rad next to it. Um, it's not necessary at all, but whatever is going to make you more comfortable. So I'm going to convert this again, so I have pi radians on bottom and 180 degrees on top. The radians cancel out. I could take out my calculator or I could leave it as is. If I left it, I would end up getting 540 over pi degrees. If I take out the calculator, like I said before, actually I'm going to do the approximately, um, it's going to be a little less than 180, so it's 171.9 degrees. And there's your Final answer for that. Now we have a word problem. Glasgow, Montana is due north of Albuquerque, New Mexico. When these word problems are saying due north, we mean directly north. We don't mean northwest or northeast. It's directly north of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Find the distance between Glasgow, which is 48 degrees and 9 minutes north latitude, and Albuquerque, which is 35 degrees, 5 uh, minutes north latitude, I don't know if I said that one correctly before, 40 degrees, 9 minutes, um, assume the radius of Earth is 3,960 miles. Okay, what is north latitude? Here I have a picture I drew for us of Earth, not perfect, sorry, and the little push bins on top and bottom represent the North Pole and the South Pole, and that red dotted line going around the outside represents the equator. And the dot in the middle of the circle uh, represents the center of our spherical Earth. And the blue lines coming out to the red represent the radius of Earth. Now I drew two different ones just because I need you to realize that with perspective, your textbook may draw the radius in a place that makes you uncomfortable just because it doesn't seem to go out to the edge of the navy blue uh, circumference right there. But it is, you have to remember, a 3D picture. And it's going to the outside of the sphere and it's still going to be 3,960 miles. Okay, north latitude means north of the equator. So the equator, think of as your starting point, your ground zero, and when we go 48 degrees, 9 minutes north latitude, and 35 degrees, 5 minutes north latitude, we're going north of the equator. So I kind of color coordinate. So Glasgow is going to be in this uh, orangey yellow color and that's going to be a little bit more than 45 degrees north. So I'm going to draw that line right over here. And then Albuquerque I have in pink, and that's 35, so it's less than halfway. It's going to be somewhere over here. So those are the angles that we're talking about to kind of show you again. Um, I'm going to try to show best I can. Here is the radius. That would have been the north latitude to Albuquerque, and that would be the north latitude to Glasgow, all right? Now, if I want to find out how far apart these two cities are, 
they're actually asking us to find is the circumference uh, or the arc length. So we need to find a part of the arc, how long that is. And we went over arc length earlier. So maybe you can pause this and find it on your own. I'm also going to need to know the angle in here to do that. So first thing you might want to do is subtract the two angles and find the difference between them. Uh, sometimes it's awkward to subtract. It's kind of like time where the minutes are sort of awkward. If you wanted to convert first from degrees, minutes, seconds back to degrees, that might make it easier. Or if you found the minutes, seconds, buttons on your calculator and the degree button on your calculator, you can use those to either convert or you can use your calculator to subtract without converting. Um, if we subtract, we end up getting that the angle between them is 13 degrees 4 minutes, or if you converted, you would get 13.0667 degrees, something like that. I'm going to leave mine as 13 degrees and 4 minutes, and I'm just going to use those buttons on my calculator. So you can play around with your calculator if you want to find those, all right? So I have that as my angle measure, and that is in degrees or degrees, minutes, seconds. So I'm going to put it over 360 degrees. I'll divide that out in my calculator in a second, and it's times the circumference. The circumference is 2 pi r, and the radius is 3,960 miles. Leaving the units there. Clean everything up. Do the math in the calculator, and you get that the distance between those two cities that are on the circumference of the Earth is approximately equal to 900 and three miles. All right, m is meters, mi is miles. Next, area of a sector. Well, area of a sector is exactly like arc length, except we're dealing with areas instead of circumference. It is a fraction of the area of the entire circle. So therefore, three dots in a triangle means therefore, the formula we can use is area of a sector, I'm just gonna use an S for now, is equal to theta over, now depends on the problem. Maybe we use 360, or maybe we use 2 pi, depending on the units given in the problem, all right, of area of a circle, and hopefully we were able to recall the area of a circle is pi r squared. If you're still mixing those up, square units are representative of area, and not squared units are usually a one-dimensional length, so circumference is a one-dimensional length. All right, the book just gives us area equals one half r squared theta, which is just one more thing to memorize, and I would rather just know how to do it the way we wrote out in red, and you'll never forget. So the problem is find the area of a sector of a circle of radius two feet formed by an angle of 30 degrees round to the nearest hundredth. So you hopefully you can pause and figure that one out on your own. So then I'm going to solve it right now. Area of a sector is equal to, well, I have 30 degrees over 360 degrees. I can cancel out the degrees, I can cancel out the zeros, and I can cancel out the three. So I'll be left with 1 12th in just a second of the area, which is pi r squared, and the radius we said was 2 feet, so pi 2 squared. So that gives us... 1 12th. Actually, I'm going to go back for a second. I want to, I was doing it before on purpose, put in my units. So 2 feet and then squared on the outside. That's better. So reducing, simplifying, working it out, I end up with 1 12th times. Now, if I square the 2, I get 4. I do not square the pi, it's not in the parentheses, so it just stays there. And if I square the feet, I get feet squared, which is why my units are square feet at the end of the day. And reduce a little bit more. The 4 pi and the 12, we could reduce, and we get 3, or I'm sorry, pi over 3 square feet or feet squared. Here's our final answer. If you put that in the calculator, you'll get 1.05. Uh, square feet. Next, we're going to compare the linear speed of an object uh, of an object traveling in circular motion. Uh, but before we do that, we just need to compare linear speed and angular speed. 
and this is actually a really hard concept for a lot of people to understand. Linear speed is the change in distance over the change in time. Angular speed is the change in angle measure over the change in time. Delta, which is that little triangle, is a Greek letter, and it represents the change in for uh, a shortcut uh, for notation. Well, linear speed, a big comparison I like to do, a big explanation, is when you ride a bicycle through a puddle and the outside of your tire gets wet, and then you see the tire tread marks on the ground. So you're sort of seeing your linear speed happen on the cement, on the pavement or the blacktop, if you're riding your bike, that is happening due to your tires rotating. So an object traveling in circular motion. All right, now a couple, just compare and contrast a couple units. Just to get a concept uh, for linear speed would be something like miles per hour or something like feet per second. And an angular speed, there's really um, two types of angle measure we've been using. So one might be something like degrees per a unit of time. So maybe we have degrees per um, hour and maybe we have something like radians per second. These are just two examples. So pay attention to your units when you're reading a word problem to make sure you're putting things in the right place and reading correctly so you know exactly what the problem is describing. Now a few slides ago we had a page that said some conclusions and I said that that was very important. And I'm just going to recall that 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians, which is also one full revolution. So we have a word problem here. Alex is spinning a ball at the end of a three-foot rope at the rate of 100 revolutions per minute, or RPMs. Find the linear speed of the ball when it was released. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be released for you to call it a linear speed, but they're saying if you let it go and it goes in a straight line, what would its speed be? So the first thing I want to find is the circumference of this circle made. The circumference of the circle made by the ball at the end of this three-foot rope. Now, it's going to make a circle. If it was a glow-in-the-dark ball and you shut off the lights and you saw the ball spinning very quickly, you probably would just see a glow-in-the-dark circle. So I want to find the circumference of that circle. Circumference is 2 pi r. It's a 3-foot rope, so it's going to be 2 pi times 3 feet. And 2 pi times 3 feet is equal to 6 pi feet. Or, I'll just write it that way. So I'm going to keep that on the side for a minute. Now I want to convert 100 revolutions per minute into the linear speed. And we said before linear speed could be miles per hour, could be feet per second, things like that. So I need a unit of measure, probably feet, and I want to know how many feet it's going per minute. So I want to convert revolutions. I want that to cancel out. I want to convert revolutions to feet. So I need to know how many revs equal how many feet. Well, one revolution is equal to the circumference, if we really think about that. And the circumference is 6 pi feet. And now we can just finish. So feet per minute is still there. 100 times 6 pi. Final answer, 600 pi feet per minute. Now, what if they wanted it in miles per hour? This chart is really useful because you could just extend that middle line, the horizontal line, go all the way across and keep converting feet into miles because there's 5,280 feet in a mile, then minutes to hours, and you can get your speed in miles per hour. You can use a calculator and get an exact dec or uh, an approximate dec decimal to know just how quickly it's going. If Instead of the linear speed, if it asks for the angular speed, you can either get that from the original given information or you can get that from your new answer. It's really up to you. So if we wanted the angular speed, I'm just going to take a second. Angular speed is asking you how many radians or degrees something is going per unit of time. So I'm going to use radians because I already have pi in here, and maybe it'll cause the pi to cancel out. So I started off with, or maybe it will just leave a pi in the answer. 
Um, I started off with 100 revolutions in one minute. So 100 revs per one minute. And I want to convert that. So one rev is equal to how many radians? Well, the number of radians in one revolution, we said earlier, was 2 pi. So I don't need units. You can use them if you want. Revs cancel. 100 times 2 pi is equal to one, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 200 pi radians per minute. And there's your answer. And there's our angular speed. Next thing we have here is just some homework for you. So I know it looks absolutely crazy. It's page 359 to 363, 1 through 117 odd. I don't expect you to do every single question, but I think you should spend time practicing and going through anything that you think you need work on, and you should be able to do any of those questions if uh, I ask you. So if you're not sure, if you need to look things over again, just watch this video again, and uh, hopefully you don't have too many problems, all right? Good luck.